don't worry about it. But that's why certain instruments, saxophones, they play in what's called E flat. So they see a C, they play C, but they hear an E flat. So you have to write everything for a saxophone, either a minor third lower or a sixth higher, and then it'll sound at the right pitch. All right? <sighs> Off to a good start. Okay, so let's uh let's just see who is here we've got loads of people on my goodness i thought <laughs> i thought i might get 10 people well this is fabulous lots and lots of very very keen people here to uh, to learn about music today um how wonderful well this is really exciting i've never taught a class uh, of, of this size before this is this is fantastic <laughs> well i hope uh, i hope you're all ready as kit kat says i hope you've got all your supplies uh, and you've got some good questions for me. To begin with, we'll do a little bit of an introduction. I'll I'll talk about some of the basic, the really fundamental stuff about music uh, in this first session. And so I'll talk probably for about 15, 20 minutes about this piece. We'll do a bit of digging around and then we'll finish with a bit of a QA. and a And if you've got general questions, uh, to, to, to kind of paraphrase QI, if you've got some general ignorance that you want to want help with, we'll have that at the end. But uh, very warm welcome, everybody. Welcome to the deep dive. This is is something new we haven't done this before uh, this is the first broadcast on home choir the first live broadcast that's not a choir rehearsal today we're going to be looking in some real depth at uh, the music of the piece that we learned yesterday this wonderful Elgar's Ave Verum Corpus and use it really as a springboard uh, to explore some of the mysteries of music um, and hopefully to unlock some of it for you and this is the first of a long-running series and I just want to start by saying if you have burning questions please do ask them I can't promise I'll get to them today um, but I will note them and we'll, we'll look at them as we go um, I'm not going to get through everything today. I mean, my goodness, the study of music. If you look at the Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians, it runs to 15, 20 volumes, all that thick, and there's a huge amount to learn. Um, but I still think we'll get through quite a lot for today. So what I thought I'd do, just to start off with, um, is just to run through. I am, after all, a teacher, and so I have my plan here. And you can see <laughs> these are our aims and objectives for the lessons, everybody. So we'll just very quickly talk about what's coming up uh, on Friday and on Sunday, and then we'll launch into our deep dive. Um, so on Friday, remember, we have no broadcast tomorrow. Tomorrow we will not be on. Um, tomorrow uh, we'll have a nice rest day. Then on Friday we will have the fun sing. And uh, I promised you Mersey Dotes and Dozy Dotes, which is a, a great music hall song, really good fun. And we'll also learn this gospel piece, which goes plenty good room, plenty good room, plenty good room on the glory train. There's a plenty good room, plenty good room, plenty good room on the glory train. Great piece. Really good, really good one for Sunday morning. Um, I couldn't resist a bit of singing. Sorry. Uh, so that is uh, Friday, and of course the Sacred Sing on Sunday, where we'll be looking at this lovely bit of Elgar that we learned yesterday. Um, that's going to be the central point of our Sacred Sing. We'll start with Mendelssohn's Cast Thy Burden. It's a little uh, little tribute to Elijah starting this week. We'll sing Thomas Tallis's amazing If You Love Me, uh, Ave Verum Corpus, of course, and then a couple of gospel songs to finish. So lots of lovely music still to come up. So let's let's talk about the study of music and I've been fascinated with music and music theory uh, for a very long time I'm going to I'm going to change the image here I've just realized I've I've shown the uh, the, the inner workings of my uh, of my screen here I'm going to change the backdrop here and I'm going to try something I haven't tried before so bear with me folks we're going to try deep dive view are you ready hold your nose here we go and okay we're in deep dive view, and I think, I'm hoping, that I'm not going to have a problem with uh, uh, with lag or things not working. So if it is looking like uh, the, the, the screen is jud juddering or anything, please let me know in the comments, all right, and I can switch back to the other view. But this gives us a way of... of diving deep into the music and this is this is what I had in mind when, uh, when I thought about this uh, this idea. So, yeah, here we are with a, with a score. Okay, and a score is really just a uh, a way of representing a piece of music. This is not the music. Okay, we call it the music, but it is just dots and lines which are a way of triggering sound as a way of instructing. Really, it's a series of instructions. You you see these, for example, down here in the organ. 
you see these pitches, you see these dots, and that tells you information that you then convert into an action that then produces the sound. Okay, so we're talking about a visual language. Uh, everything on this sheet behind me here is uh, from Elgar to us. They are his instructions to us. Um, and I was taught uh, when I was at university, one of my composition professors, he said, the only way we have of communicating with the great composers is through the sheet music. If they wrote something down, and particularly if they wrote it, on the score rather than an editor coming along and editing it later. If the composer wrote it, they really meant it. So please follow their instructions. And I, I've taken that to heart throughout the years and I've used that to inspire me to learn as much about music theory as I can. Um, I think it's a fascinating subject. And so what I thought I'd do to start with, uh, rather than just dive straight into the Elgar, I thought we'd start with uh, something slightly more straightforward. And I thought I'd start by talking about pitches and about keys. Now, if you understand what keys are, if you understand all your key signatures, uh, if you understand why we use them and how they work, fantastic. And you can just feel smug and superior to everybody else in the room, the other 50-something people, uh, while I explain this. Uh, but for those of you who've never really, I suppose, understood what keys are for or why, why they're here, this next few minutes is for you. So what we're looking at on the page behind me is a, a score. We have a series of notes. Let's so check that we can hear this. Beautiful. Beautifully sung. So we have eight pitches. Okay. One. I'll turn that down a little bit, actually. <laughs> it's a little bit on the loud side. Excuse me. Right. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight, as in octagon, as in octave. Okay, that's why it's called an octave, because it has eight notes. And we start on a C here, okay, and we rise to a C here. And you can hear that they are related. They are both Cs. But they are separated by this, this interval of eight pitches. In actual fact, there are 12 pitches in between these, these two notes, but we, we won't worry about that. We're just looking at the moment at a major scale, okay? And so what we have here is a major scale. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. And I think we can all recognize the shape of that scale. If you've ever seen The Sound of Music, you, you know, Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. That is a major scale, okay? And when you have a series of notes like this, arranged one note after the other, rising in pitch, it gives you um, kind of a framework to create a piece of music. So if I was going to write a piece in C major, I would write a piece using these notes, using C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. If I use those pitches, admittedly in any particular random order, but if I use those, I would be writing in the key of C. Okay, it's a bit like saying, I'm going to bake a cake with these ingredients. So I'm going to use eggs and flour and chocolate and cocoa. I'm going to make a chocolate cake. If you want to change that, it's a little bit tricky <laughs> as you go, but you start with the ingredients. All right, so we've chosen our key. Uh, and th the reason you'd want to write in C major, well, um, if you're using a piano, if you're using a keyboard, uh, if you look at the keyboard and you find C, all right, C on our keyboard is to the left of the two black keys. So when you're looking at the keyboard, you see white keys and black keys, and you find the two and the three and the two and the three and the black keys. You find the two black keys, and just to the left of that, you find C. And so if you wanted to write something in C, you just use all the white keys. And there you have a piece using those notes. We are all in C. All is well. And this is usually the, the place that we start when we're learning about music. You use C major because it's all white notes. There are none of these funny what we call accidentals. You might have seen things like that, for example, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. So in order to create that, we start. See, so notice on, on the score here, 
Oh, by the way, there's a, I've got my window open. There's a playground just outside, and there's a small person who clearly doesn't want to be taken home. So she's expressing herself uh, in the only way she knows how, through the medium of a loud tantrum. Um, so if we just have a look at the score, before we before we move out of the key of C, if we just look at how these pitches are arranged on the, on the score, you can see here that this note has got a line through it. We'll talk about that in a minute. Then this note is just under the line and is sort of sitting in, in a space here. Then we've got a note with a line through it space, a line, a space, a line, and a space. And if it were to carry on up, line, space, line, space, and so on. Okay, so you'll never see, certainly not on a proper score, you'll never see a note that's kind of not quite on the line, not quite in the space. It's either on the line or in the space, and that gives you a very clear framework. You're either going to see the note, as, as you can see here, sitting in the middle of the lines or it's going to be firmly placed on the line all right and uh, that's a really important aspect to remember because that really gives you a very clear visual reference when you're looking at it you can see well that note's got a line through it so it's going to be one of a, of a certain number of notes um, this line here all right that you see going through our C this is called a ledger line and this is just an extra line that's been put in so that you can see very quickly that that's a C. If there was no line, you wouldn't know whether it was a D or a C or a B. And you see as we go down, they add extra ledger lines here. All right. Uh, so there we are. There is our, our scale. Now what you might notice as, as we go forward is there's some extra stuff around here. I think we can all work out what soprano, alto and tenor mean. Uh, this line here, well, we'll talk about that in a moment, but all this basically does is just bracket the choir together. So this is a way of, of indicating, well, these are your soprano, alto, and tenor, and bass lines, okay? Um, so the next question is, what's this thing here? What's this? This funny symbol? Well, I think most of us would be able to say that this is a treble clef, and that's exactly what it is, but what's it for? Well, I've been asked this question a lot over the years, and um, what this is, is this is a little bit like the key on a map. Uh, this is a way of helping the, the singer or the player, the musician, identify what the pitches are in the music. Okay, this unlocks the stave. Without this, you've just got a frame, and you don't know where the pitches are. Okay, um, so what this is, ladies and gentlemen, well, first of all, let's have a look at it. It starts here. Actually, I'm in the way of it. <laughs> that helps. Right, let's try that again. Starts here, curls round, goes up, and comes down. All right. Now, a lot of this is, is elaborate decoration. What we're looking at here, ladies and gentlemen, is a very large capital G. If you look at it, can you see the capital letter G? Yeah, there it is, G, and it's sitting on this line here. And so that means this symbol means that this line is G, and not just any G, the G above middle C, okay? And that symbol means that that line is G. Once you know where that line is, and you know where that G is, it, your, your brain can click in, and suddenly you therefore know that this note is A, this is B, and so on, okay? So the treble clef tells you that this line here, this second line up, is G. If we know that's G, then we know that's E, we know that that's B, and so on. This one down here, as you can see, this is a treble clef, but with an eight below it. And I had a specific question yesterday. What's, you know, why have we got an eight on this treble clef? What's that there for? Well, this is a tenor treble clef. And what this means is that, yes, that's a C, this isn't the alto, and this is a C, but listen. Did you hear? There's the top one. Ah, middle C, and the tenor, it's an octave lower. That's what that eight means. So it means it's the same the same pitches as in the treble clef, but one octave lower. And it's a way of making the tenor line more readable for tenors. If you if you use the bass clef, which we'll get to in a minute, the tenors are often off the top of the stave using lots of ledger lines. And it, it, ledger lines are okay at a pinch, but they can also be really tricky to have to deal with at, at pace. So this was invented to, to mean that the tenors could sing along using the same recognisable pitches to know that that's a G, that's a B and so on, as the sopranos and altos, but just to sound an octave lower to make it easier to read. So we come now to this one down here, 
and a lot of people this is where um this is where their musical knowledge perhaps stops i think the the, the treble clef most people will have encountered at some point the bass clef is usually the point where i have uh, students say oh, i don't i don't do the bass clef i don't read the bass clef well there's no reason to worry about it because the bass clef just like the treble clef is a way of uh of just labeling a line so now that you know that this one is a g okay have a look at this one and what letter does this look like i'm going to let you answer this one okay if you do me a favor if you know the answer all right if you actually know the answer don't tell me if you're new if you have no idea have a guess what letter could that be it's mm, could be a d couldn't it it's not really a c or an e what do we think? It's not the alto clef, Carolyn. This is the bass clef. We'll talk about the alto clef in just a minute. What do people think? Let's see. Because this, again, it sits on the line. It tells you it's a note. Uh, this is the bass clef, so it's going to be lower than middle C. I'll give you a clue. That's the note. Biddy's saying it could be an E, and it, it, could, it could look like an E, but it's backwards, isn't it? You're very close. It's very close. Well, this is an F, okay? And if you look at it, it kind of looks like it with these two lines. And it means that this line here, this one, is an F. And not just any F, this is the F specifically below middle C. So that's what the bass clef is. That's why it's there. Now, there are other clefs. We'll talk about those in future weeks. We don't need to worry about that now. But the other clefs, the alto clef, the tenor clef, soprano clef, there are all of these clefs. They are just a way of taking the, this this frame, this what we call the stave or the staff, if, if you're American, uh, and making it make sense. All right. So that's what the clefs are. That's how they work. Uh, some people were asking yesterday, what's a, what are bars and what are bar lines? Well, you can see here. Um, at the moment, these notes, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and so on, have been grouped into groups of four. Okay. Um, now, this isn't this isn't really a piece of music. It, it hasn't got any shape to it, and so on. If it was a piece of music, I would want to put what we call a time signature in, and I'm just going to put that here and just check that you can see it. You can. Marvelous. So here at the top, I have said four, four. All right, and what this means is four beats in a bar. And a bar is just a collection of beats, and that collection repeats, and that forms a pattern, okay? So if you uh, if you think about four, four, for example, it's just four beats in a bar. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, and so on, okay? Three in a bar. Same thing, same beat, except you're in groups of three. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three, four, two, three. Okay? And the information that we, we glean from the time signature here is the top number refers to how many beats are in the bar. So that's a really important number. We can see here four, and we've got one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. If I change the time signature to three, four, watch what happens. It rewrites it and puts the bar lines in different places because the bar lines indicate where the groups of notes end. So we've got one, two, three, bar line. One, two, three, bar line. One, two, three, bar line. Okay, everyone with me so far? Now the lower number, I'm going to explain this now. This will take a little bit of time to understand. So the top number indicates how many beats in a bar and the bar is the collection of uh, of beats that forms the pattern. The bottom note indicates what type of note we're using. So here we're using what we call crotchets. In America, these are called quarter notes. Uh, uh, and so we, we're using um, this as, the, as the, uh, the, the mark of our beat. One, two, three, one, two, three. You can use uh, two beat notes as the foundation of your beat. So you could have three, two. All right, so two beat note that would yeah that would be three two. You can use um, half notes uh, or quarter notes, so that would be three eight or three sixteen. So to begin with, I don't want anyone to worry about that lower number. Just note that the top number in the time signature refers to how many beats are in the bar, and therefore we are in uh, we we want to be in four four for this Elgar. All right, everyone with me so far? Take a deep breath. Let me just check in on the comments, see how everyone's doing. So I'm going to just drag this out of the way very quickly. So how is everyone doing? Good. Lots of people get, get, guessing F, 
Brilliant job. Well done. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk now about keys. And this again, this is going to take a bit of time for everybody to uh, become fully comfortable with, but. We've been working exclusively in C major at the moment. And C major is a lovely key, uh, and it's, it's the key that we use when we write songs for children. Why do we use C major? It's because if you uh, if you've ever been around small, very small people, you know, um, one, two, two years old, up to five or six, and you ask them to sing, and you listen to them speak, and you match their voice to a pitch, children speak and sing in C major. Oh, great. They have a very limited range, but, yeah, it really is. You know, bar, bar, black sheep, have you any wool? It's all these songs are all in C, because that is the key that children's voices naturally uh, uh, begin as. And as we get older, uh, our voices deepen. In some cases, they get higher, uh, and all of these pitches open up to us. And so a composer will use a, a different key for all sorts of reasons. There are, um, there are a number of people that believe that keys have individual characters. There are some people that believe that keys have different colours. Um, as in, when you hear it, there are some people who see colour when they hear a particular pitch or a particular uh, key. In all seriousness, a key is just a collection of notes that you use to write a tune. So think of it as the ingredients that you're going to use to write your tune. So to begin with, this is, this is C. Our, our piece that we've been studying, this lovely bit of Elgar, is in G. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up, hopefully, I'll bring up my score. There we go. There it is. And we can see here that we are in the key of G. Well, how do we know we're in the key of G? Well, let's have a look at the score, first of all. We've got a first chord here, and let's add these notes up. So we've got a, a, a G in the bass. We've got a D above it. We've got a B above that, and a G above that. And that is a G major chord. We'll get, a, get to the difference between major and minor shortly. In, in short, uh, and this is very simple, major tends to be happy, happy sounding, and minor tends to be sad sounding that's very very simple but anyway we're starting with a g major chord all right that's one way of, of uh, one one bit of information if we look at the last chord again we can see here g g b d it's a g major chord so we're starting and finishing on a g major chord that's a big big indicator that we're going to be uh in the key of g but the thing that gives us the information that we really really need is what we call the key signature okay and here in uh, at the very start of the piece we can see right next to uh, the treble clef okay this C here this is just a shorthand for 4-4 four, four, okay common time it being the most uh, regular time rather than, than putting all the extra ink in 4-4 four, four, if you see a C that means common time that means 4-4 four, four. and so what we've got here is we've got this funny symbol here in between the treble clef and the time signature this is a sharp symbol Okay, and this means that one of the notes in the key, one of the pitches, is not going to be a white note, it's going to be a, one of the black notes. Okay, all the other notes in the key of G are white, but one of them is going to be black. In, and why? Well, that's so that we can make a scale that sounds right, that sounds appropriate. So if I go back to my, uh, my teaching page here, and we can see here, and I've got the alto pitches here, I've got the same shape, I've got C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move those, all those pitches, I'm just going to move them up, one, two, three, four. So I'm going to start on a G, okay, G. And we're going to listen up, just listen to this scale, okay, as we go G. Hmm, something's not right there, is it? Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, da, 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 da. Most of that sounded like a, a normal major scale. Uh, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. Except one of the pitches wasn't right. And it was the F, the penultimate note here. Okay. In a major scale, the distance between the last two notes should always be a semitone. Okay. So there's something wrong there. What we have to do is to turn this pitch here into an F sharp. Okay, I'm just going to click down here on my little keypad. I don't even see this, but I'm going to turn it, I'll turn it off and turn it on again. So now it's an F sharp. So if we now listen to that. And there we have a major scale in G. 
appallingly played. Um, so if you're a soprano, you'll recognize this uh, this shape, you'll recognize this pitch. Uh, this is a very nice key for sopranos to sing in, it's G major. So the reason that we have a key signature is to save a lot of time as you go through the piece, if you, if you uh, just use this sh uh, sharp symbol every time there's an F sharp, it just adds to the clatter on, on the score. So what they do is they use this technique. So it's basically saying here, every time you see an F in the score, play an F sharp instead. That's what that means. Okay, and it, it gets uh, it gets even more interesting as we start to move to things like well the next key along is D major and that has two sharps, and then the next one is A major that has three sharps. Okay, and so you can see it's starting to get more complicated, and uh, this is where people usually, as I said, their eyes just sort of spin slightly. Well, how, how can a brain cope with that? Well, it is just a matter of practice. It's a matter of um, uh, exposing yourself to all these different types of music, playing the scales, um, you know, playing them on a piano, singing them, just get, getting used to the idea that there are these all of these different scales, and some of them have got a huge number uh, of funky symbols in the key signatures. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this back to G major, and I'm going to show you one quick graphic here, everybody. And um, don't panic about this, but I'm going to bring up a graphic, hopefully over here. So are we ready? Three, two, one. Aha, there we go. So this is called the circle of fifths. And um, <laughs> at this point, I wouldn't blame you for, for perhaps being uh, slightly put, uh, put out by this. In fact, what I'm going to do, I'm going to make it slightly bigger and I'm going to shift over. So bear with me a second. Here we go. Right. So if you look at this, all I want you to do to begin with is just to look at the C at the top of the page. Can you see the big letter C? And above it, we can see there is n there are no accidentals in the key signature. Okay, so the key of C means we use the scale of C to write our music. Next door to that, you can see G. And we can see here it has one sharp in the key signature. Okay, all I did in order to make that scale is I played all white notes, but I raised the F to an F sharp as per the instruction here, and I got a G major scale. How lovely. If I didn't have it, remember, I get this. Okay, which itself is a perfectly nice scale. It's, uh, it has a name. It's called the Mixolydian mode, but we don't need to use that. We're using G major. If we want to go one step round on the circle, you can see we're now at D and D has two sharps. So if I start on D, and I play all white notes, but I change the F sharp, or the F to an F sharp, and the C to a C sharp, I get a major scale. If I play it without those two sharps, I get something different. I get what's called the Dorian mode. And there are some lovely songs written in the Dorian mode. All the lonely people, where do they all come from? Songs in the Dorian mode. Um, but we're looking for the major. And as we go around, you see, we start, we add, with each one, we add a sharp, and we get down here to, uh, well, some ri frankly ridiculous uh, key signatures. F sharp major, C sharp major. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven sharps. Basically, every note has been raised by a semitone. Uh, and, and there we get, it, it get, gets very complicated. Don't worry about the notes at the bottom of the cycle, just note the ones at the top. So that was going in one direction, that was using sharps, and in the other direction, these are flats. And so this is where you would take a white note, instead of playing the note immediately above it, you play the note just below it. So if we're playing the key of F, we play all white notes, except for the B, which we play as a B flat. And there we have a major scale. All right. So I'm gonna I'm going to move up into the piece now. All right, everybody, because I've spent a lot of time talking about these these basic ideas. We'll talk next time a little bit more about the relationship between these keys. Some of you might have noticed they call it a circle of fifths here um, because it moves in fifths. C to G is a fifth. G to D is a fifth. D to A is a fifth. A to E is a fifth. And there's a very good harmonic reason for that. We'll talk about that next time. But I want to talk uh, very quickly about uh, the piece itself. And uh, I'll just say hello to everybody. Hello, Lewis. Good to see you. Hello, Anna. 
Uh, do we have a new section of the choir, the mathematicians? I love it. Um, so let's go back to this lovely bit of Elgar. I'm just going to come back to the middle of the screen. Here we go. Um, and so let's uh, let's spend just a few minutes looking at this. If you have any specific questions, folks, uh, as we go, do chime in because this is now a bit more interactive. Um, so let's very quickly talk about Elgar and his style. Elgar is a late Romantic composer. Romantic refers not to his character, although I'm sure he uh, he had his moments. Um, it refers to the period of history uh, in which he he was. Uh, active and we're talking here about the late 19th century primarily and that is well and truly in uh, the mix of what we call the romantic era and the romantic era um, introduced a lot of new ideas into music um, it's composers like Beethoven who started it Schubert Schumann and as the romantic era as the 19th century progressed you've got composers such as Berlioz and Wagner and ultimately Elgar uh, he's a British composer was born just up the road from me here uh, very near Worcester um, lived around Great Malvern, beautiful part of the UK. If you've never been, do visit when you, when you come over, when, uh, when things are easier. Um, he was the son of a violin teacher and piano tuner uh, and uh, grew up just surrounded by music, was a self-taught composer, um, originally trained as a solicitor, uh, as a lawyer, and then decided he didn't like it after a couple of weeks and ended up as a piano teacher. And I think things worked well for him in the end. Uh, one of the main features of romantic music that Elgar really understands is the use of what we call chromaticism okay chromaticism and if you've ever played a musical instrument you'll have been asked to play a chromatic scale and this is what a chromatic scale sounds like <laughs> Okay, moving by semitone, and a semitone is the shortest distance between pitches in Western classical music. Okay, and uh, an example of, of chromaticism can be seen here in the tenors. The tenor sings. Uh, ah, da, da. Okay, well, actually, that's not the tenor, that's the organ part. But even within the organ part, da, 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 da. there's lots of this semi uh, semitone movement. Why? Well. In order to understand that, we need to look at the origins of the word chromaticism. And if you are, if you understand linguistics, I think you can already work it out. Chromatic chroma color. That's what chromaticism means. The use of semitones adds complexity. It adds color in the same way that um, uh, that, that people's character traits add character and add color to them. Um, and the more you get to know somebody, the more you get to know their all their sort of intricate workings. And the thing is, if you listen to the music of um, uh, certainly Handel, Vivaldi, they use a lot of what we call consonant chords, very, very clear what they're doing. Okay, when they write using chromaticism, um, for example, we're learning Elijah on self-isolation choir at the moment. You get this. The harvest now is over, the summer dews. You have this chromatic movement. It adds character. It adds uh, charm sometimes. It adds um, a feeling. Uh, if, you, if you use it in a certain way, you look at the music of Chopin and Liszt. It adds a real sensuality to music. Wagner knew that when he wrote the music for Tristan and Isolde. And if we just, if I play you the opening of this, just the piano part here, and just listen to just these first four bars. We all know what bars are now. So I'm going to go from the opening. Here we go. Two beats. One, two, and then we play. So that's that's really all, all I want to look at for the next few moments is this first four bars. Um, and if I just play you those chords and I take out some of the some of the uh, more interesting color, you see what I mean. If I if I just make that a little bit more standard and take out some of Elgar's color, listen to it. Okay, it's, it's actually a perfectly nice tune, but the, it doesn't have the same sense of poignancy. It doesn't have the same sense of, uh, as I say, character and colour. Okay, if we just harmonise that tune. That's perfectly good. Ha harmonically, that makes sense, doesn't it? But, listen to what Elgar does. It's 
So that's something very different, isn't it? If we actually just play that really slowly, play the first chord, that's fine. That's G major. That's home, okay? And that's like standing in your front porch getting ready to go out for the day. Lovely. All's well. And you take a step, and straight away something goes wrong. <laughs> and suddenly... And we, we, suddenly we are at the start of the second bar. If I play these notes, a G, an E, a B, and an A, something's not right. That's not a consonant chord. That's not a chord that shines. There is some tension in that chord. And the tension's here, and it falls. And then he creates even more tension before resolving it. And then again, tension, release, tension, release, home, home, tension, release, home. And so what Elgar's doing is he's using chromaticism, this moving by semitone, to create this sort of like a squeeze box, like an accordion, where there are times when, you know, the, the, the music is, is creating quite an intense clash. I and mean, if I just play that note in bar, this bar here, play this chord, G, C sharp, which already creates tension, B flat, and then an F sharp on the top. Wow. I mean, that's a really crunchy chord, isn't it? And if I take out the two middle notes, I just play the G and the F sharp. Listen to this. Ooh, that's really stark. If I play them an, uh, even closer, so G and an F sharp. If I play them right next to each other. Yeah, that's a really intense clash, but if you hide it in the middle of a chord like that, you end up with... A lovely, uh, as I say, a, a lovely um, sense of tension and release. And he he just writes that all the way through. Tension, release, tension, release. Um, the only exception is when he is bringing us home. So if I play the second half of the phrase, I played you the first bit. If I now pick it up in bar five, listen to what happens. Because he's taken us, he's taken us from home to away. Okay, away is is wherever it is. It could be work, it could be down the road to the supermarket, but he's taken us somewhere else. In fact, I will play from the beginning. Starting on home in G. So, home. Something's going wrong. So we're not at home, but we've arrived somewhere, haven't we? There's really a sense of, oh, okay, we're here, but we're not finished because we're gonna go back here. He, he takes us uh, more more firmly to this other place, wherever we are. Uh, and what Elgar is doing here is he's using harmonies, he's using chords um, to propel the music forward. We'll talk about how chords work, I think, in a future session. The most important thing to note, though, everybody, is this, this sound, okay? If we're in the key of G, listen to this, and now listen to this again. Can you hear? We have a chord here. In fact, if I take you to the, this chord that I'm talking about, it's, uh, where is it? Start to mortis. There we are. Here. Mortis in examine. Let's just have a listen to this. This is, uh, this is an important aspect. Okay. We all know that feeling. There we are. That is coming home. And what El and Elgar uses this throughout the piece. He he brings us home before he takes us out again. Uh, and this is the 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 end of the uh, of the repeated section just before the O Clemenzo PA. And he takes us briefly home. Examine. And it feels so nice to come home, having been away to all these other places. Um, and what Elgar's using is something called a perfect cadence. And again, we'll talk about perfect cadences in a future session. What it is, is a way, it's punctuation in music. Okay, if you hear this. Well, what should follow should be this, shouldn't it? Yep. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, five, one. And uh, so Elgar is, is using these... Um, He's using the language of music and the language of harmony uh, to indicate really where the tension and release is happening and where we should be coming home. And really, 
that, ladies and gentlemen, is is the at the core of what Elgar's doing. In terms of the uh, the actual structure of the piece, if we just quickly look at it, I'm just going to change the uh, layout of this so we can see a little bit more of it. Let's go fit page height. Aha, that's better. So we can see here it starts with the soprano solo. It, legato here means smooth. We have a little swell here where we get louder and get quieter. We move forwards. Dim means get quieter still. The choir comes in singing pianissimo, ave verum corpus natum. They have this swell here up and down. And he starts at home and he takes us away by the end. We then have the second half of the tune because we've arrived at this other place, wherever it is. We've, we've got to work. And then we get this curious latus perforato munda fluxit sanguine. And then this is the climax of the piece, really. Est or nobis. It's a big, loud moment. Brings it down. Then the choir echo. He's decided to do this in unison. This is a really interesting uh, thought because, of course, when you have everybody singing in unison, it greatly increases the intensity of what's being sung. If you're singing in harmony, this... Uh, it's, it's lovely, but it's a wall of sound. If everyone's in unison, it's very, very powerful indeed. So everyone comes in singing uh, Cuius Latus Perforatum. The Esto Nobis climax is preserved, although in harmony here. Mortis in examine. He brings us home, but it's not the end. It's not quite the end. Because he's uh, he's left his keys in the car. I think that's the problem. You know, he's, he's left his bag in the car. Uh, so he takes us off. We sing O Clemens, O Pie. In, uh, in unison, O Dolcis Jesu, and then to finish, this is just this most wonderful Elgarian touch. And it is like, I think Kit Kat said this yesterday, um, it's a bit like the music is melting at the end. So uh, we've arrived home. Examine, oh, and you think, what's he doing? Oh, oh, he's taking us to a minor key. Are we going on? Oh, ah, well, this is still G major, but it's not quite home. The bass needs to descend, descending to G. And it's the basses who lead us home in this piece. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That is Elgar's Ave Verum Corpus. And uh, so it's in the key of G major. It is uh, four beats in a bar. And he uses these wonderful chromatic lines to create tension, release, tension, release, tension, release, and so on. And uh, if, you, if you've not encountered Elgar's work before, can I thoroughly recommend his Enigma Variations for Orchestra, uh, his Cello Concerto, his Violin Concerto, uh, his Oratorio, uh, The Dream of Gerontius, and many, many, many more works. So um, I've got five minutes, folks. If you've got any particular questions that we haven't covered today, let me know, please, uh, and I'll answer them. I'm going to have a sip of my coffee. But I hope that was, uh, I hope that was of interest. Um, as I say, music is a very deep subject, and so there are all sorts of things I'm sure we didn't get to today. We'll be talking next time a little bit more about this relationship between away and home, and we'll be introducing new terms such as tonic and dominant, which I know have other meanings in, in English, but in music refer to tonic, refers to home, and dominant refers to that, that other place, work, wherever it is, that leads you home. All right, so... How are we doing? Kit Kat saying 4-4 four, four is also called Common Time. Older pieces of music have no time signature as they were uh, monastery sung. Yes, well, if we're talking about really early music, um, we're talking about the music of the medieval era, no, there would have been no time signature, largely because uh, music was not grouped into uh, groups of beats. Rather, it was a single line that you would sing, and it wouldn't necessarily have a, a, a consistent rhythmic structure. So if you were going, uh, if you, for example, Gloria in excelsis Deo would not have a time signature because there's no 
Gloria in Asia. There's no beat that you can clap to. Um, and a lot of early monastic music was, was simply a melodic uh, setting of biblical text or of a psalm or of so on. Uh, so it was a way of um, articulating religious texts musically and writing it down, but there wouldn't have been a beat. Um, and it was only really in the Renaissance era, and we're talking here, so 15th century, that you started to see music written down with a beat. A lot of it came from uh, instrumental music. So uh, instrumental music, you know, it's it's not the same as singing, as, as I'm sure we all know. Um, with instrumental music, you do need to have a sense of, right, here's the beat, we're all playing together, and go. Uh, and so those two styles sort of me melded and merged, uh, and we started to see music actually in, in the church that bore a lot of, uh, of relation to instrumental music. So, how are we doing? Fab. Great stuff. So, uh, lots of people saying that they love Elgar. Splendid. Well, look, I will... Um, I think what I'll do is, so if you've got any specific questions about today's piece, if you want to send me an email, my Qquire email address still works, so qquire at homechoir.uk Send me a question, and if I can cover it, I will. Um, we'll be back next week, as I say, with that lovely piece of Haydn. In the meantime, everybody, no homework for this week. The only thing, though, if you do have a minute um, to Google, I'll just get this back up again. Where is it? There we are. If you can Google the circle of fifths, if you're in, if you want to find out more about keys and how it works, um, Google this image, this one here, uh, and just just have a, have a gaze at it from time to time. And one thing you can do is just have it as a chart. And when you're singing along, if you're in one of my other choirs, for example, self-isolation choir, for example, and you're singing a piece, and you look at it, and you just note the, the key signature and see if you can find it on the chart, okay? Notice out here, just to very quickly, the capital letters refer to major keys, and the smaller letters refer to minor keys. And we'll talk about that relationship in a future session. But well done, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. I've really enjoyed this. Uh, I love... <laughs> mattering about music and uh, sharing uh, the fascinating aspects of it. The one thing I want to say, and I want to make this really clear, music theory uh, isn't scary or it shouldn't be. Um, the study of music is, is it, the best way to look at it is when you're, when you're reading a piece of music, if you make a mistake, um, one of the best bits of advice I was ever given is don't get cross, don't get... Argh. Instead, go, that was really interesting. Why did I make that mistake? What, what's happening there? And then go towards that issue. And it might be that, you know, you you, you didn't fully understand what a key was or, or you, you'd misread a note or, you, you, you know, the rhythm was, was weird. So if any of you out there are harboring uh, anxiety or, or, you know, I don't like theory, over the next week, have a think about letting that go and come along next week uh, looking forward to studying a little bit more. Well, as I said, we'll look at um, Haydn. We'll have a look at some chords. We'll introduce the terms tonic and dominant and have a lot of fun. So thanks for being here, everyone. Uh, I'm going to sign off and go and get my son from school. And if we're in self-isolation choir, of course, I will see you at 5 p.m. The rest of you, I'll see you on Friday for the fun sing. Thanks so much for being here today, folks. Bold new experiment, and I'll see you very soon. Take care, everyone.